welcome. Opposition is mounting, but so far LG is not relenting. The Korea-based electronics maker continues to work on its new headquarters in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. And what is wrong with that in a state hungry for jobs and taxes? Just one thing, say opponents. This green vista of the Palisades along the Hudson, north of the George Washington Bridge. It's a view they fear will be spoiled by the LG building, which at 143 feet would stand taller than the trees. And opponents foresee this future as well, a skyline where only a tree line has been visible for millennia. Those are the opponents' renderings, but LG has its pictures too. The Palisades are already far from pristine, they claim, with this rendering. And they claim in this one that their building will just barely peek over the treetops, not a skyline. We will try to separate fact from propaganda in just a moment. Also on today's program, hemp. Think rope, not dope. A loyalist says it's a wonder plant to fix our diet and the soil and wean the country off petroleum to boot. And in our public intellectual segment, where we examine new research with the power to change our minds and public policy, we will dig deep into a motivation we ought to resist, spite. Turns out it may have an evolutionary upside. Plus, toward the end of the hour, we'll tackle a crucial question about New York City's continued prosperity. Is our tech sector, a.k.a. Silicon Alley, all it's hacked up to be? First, though, LG versus the Vista. The latest broadside against the eight-story headquarters plan is a satirical video from the activist group Protect the Palisades. Hey, what's up? I'm the guy who loves seeing great things get ruined. Like when a band replaces their awesome lead singer with some schmo. Love it. Unnecessary remakes of classic movies? Uh. Face tattoos? The best! And that's why I'm so psyched about LG Corporation's plans to totally ruin the Palisades. Come on, let's check it out. The Palisades, a pristine stretch of unspoiled natural beauty. These ancient cliffs run for miles along the Hudson River just above the George Washington Bridge. And they've been protected for, like, forever. But LG was all, who cares? We're gonna build our new office building right here. LG is gonna ruin this national landmark so we can look at their headquarters instead. How badass is that? And then once this building goes up, who's to stop tons of other buildings from going up all along the Palisades? Take that, boring old majestic vistas. LG says this building will create jobs. Now, they know the same amount of jobs could be created with a lower building that wouldn't ruin the Palisades, but that would be totally lame. No one would even see that building. So get ready, America. Goodbye, beautiful Palisades. Hello, LG Tower. I'm super psyched. Thanks, LG. Life's good. We like seeing stuff get ruined. That from the group, Protect the Palisades. This battle's been going on for almost a year, and just this week, more opposition. The head of the National Park Service called on LG to reduce the height of the plan headquarters. New York Senator Chuck Schumer did the same. So did a number of progressive investor groups. And those calls follow four former New Jersey governors, two Republicans and two Democrats, asking for LG to redesign their structure. But LG has political allies, too, like the construction trades, New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez, and the mayor of Englewood Cliffs. To guide us through all this, via Skype, Michelle Byers, executive director of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, and on the phone, reporter Kim Ludak from The Record newspaper, who is in Trenton, covering yet another development in the story. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for coming on with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, Michelle, you first. All the images that we just saw had to do with how the Palisades look from New York across the Hudson River. Why are you getting involved as a New Jersey environmentalist? Well, the, the Palisades are in New Jersey, and people see the Palisades all the time, whether they live in New York or New Jersey, and, you know, people from all over the East Coast, in fact, Americans and visitors to our country go on the bridge and see the Palisades. It's, it's really not even a local issue. It's a national issue, and there's no surprise. It's a national, historic, and natural landmark. You saw LG's uh, visual of how the building would just be a small white spot sticking up a little bit along the expanse of the rest of the unfettered Palisades. Would it be such a bad thing, even from the New York side? Well, you know, there's a reason why all the municipalities along that stretch of the Palisades have kept their height limit at 35 feet. 
uh, and things that currently are above the tree line now are very de minimis. Um, LG is, is continues to say that their building will ver barely peak above the tree line, but in fact, it's 80 feet above the tree line. Uh, and the images right now that are going back and forth are completely disingenuous. Uh, you really need to, to get a specialist to uh, develop these simulated images based on the elevation of the site, the actual specs of the building, um, and they have to be taken from the right angle from the, with the right camera. Um, and there's a lot of, of time and effort invested into uh, coming up with the images as to what this would look like once built. And the images that LG has been putting forth are not of that caliber. Well, let me show you another LG image. This one purports to say that, hey, this isn't actually all so pristine as the Protect the Palisades video makes it out to be anyway. There's stuff there. How would you interpret this image differently than they do? Primarily, the area south of the GW Bridge in Fort Lee has been built up to a large degree with high towers, but that doesn't justify doing the same thing north of the George Washington Bridge. So it's really a false representation, in your opinion, of what the debate is about. It's about a more northerly stretch of the Palisades, not what they're showing here. That's correct. And you know, uh, everyone can debate all they want what image, whose image is right or wrong, but the fact again is that the, the height limit of 35 feet has been respected and maintained in that region for decades. Uh, and a building 80 feet over the tree line is going to be a very big visible uh, obstruction above the tree line. Uh, Kim Ludek, from, from the record, give us more on the New Jersey side of the coalition from your reporting. Why have mayors of six cities and towns around Englewood Cliffs come out against this for what is, on one level, a New York issue? Um, the LG building, it represents jobs. It represents the economy for New Jersey, as far as Englewood Cliffs is concerned and as far as the county, Bergen County, is concerned. Um, and, you know, uh, these mayors are not professional environmentalists like Michelle is, who would have a philosophical commitment to stopping something like this. Why is there so much local political opposition surrounding Englewood Cliffs? Well, the argument has been that it, it is very much a New Jersey issue. Like, yes, there are a lot of New Yorkers who are concerned about the view, but there's the argument that the people who, um, who hike, who bike in Palisades Park, they're going to be impacted by this. Um, this is a hearing this morning in the New Jersey Senate. Jeff Pitifoli is the head of Sierra Club here in New Jersey. He said, you know, you'll be able to see this uh, from the Ramapo Ridges. So there is a very strong argument that's being made by the environmentalists that there are many, many New Jerseyans who are also going to be impacted and are going to have their views impacted by this building. But Michelle, Senator Menendez, I understand, has taken LG side. Why is the, he the odd liberal out here? Well, uh, you know, first of all, I'm not sure that that's actually the case. Uh, we've been talking to Senator Menendez, and, uh, you know, I'm not positive that he is fully in support of this as proposed. Um, I think Senator Men Menendez and many of our legislators in New Jersey are interested in jobs. Uh, and, you know, as has been made many times clear, uh, we're not talking about no jobs. We're talking about jobs, and maybe even more jobs, because my understanding is when you build a building with a bigger foundation, you have more jobs created than by building a tall, slender building. So uh, despite what I read about Senator Menendez, you think this is an evolving situation, and he may yet come out against the LG building as designed. That's correct. Um, Kim, in Trenton, after all these decades, with a 35-foot height limit for precisely this reason. Why did the city of Englewood Cliffs pass a variance now, an exception, for LG right at this time? Is this about economic desperation? Or why now, after decades and decades, I say 100 years, of preserving that tree line? I mean, you said it. Economics are the driving force. Um, you know, the prevailing line has been that this is going to bring jobs to the entire region, construction jobs. You'll have um, the LG workforce is supposed to swell from about 500 now to about 1,200 in 2017. Not to mention, it, it'll be a huge readable for Englewood Cliffs. So they 
they very, very much want it for that reason. But the argument that um, Michelle was just making is that the rateables and everything else, uh, all these economic indicators, would be the same if they just built horizontally on their property, and there's apparently enough property to do that, rather than as vertically on the property. They could create the same number of square footage of office space. Uh, they could create the same number of jobs, same number of construction jobs, as well as LG jobs. Why don't they just say, OK, gosh, you know, everybody's lining up against us on this. We want to be good corporate citizens, and we can still have our fancy new headquarters. In fact, let's show, we're going to put up on the screen, before you even answer that question, um, what this space looks like in an artist's rendering. In fact, this is LG's own rendering, if I'm not mistaken. And the building on the right, a little further back in the shot, is the eight-story building as envisioned that would stick, out, stick up over the tree line. But you see there's a lot of acreage there. And there's a lower building right next to it. And the opponents are just saying, well, build another one or two like that one. You've got the space. And LG doesn't dispute, I don't think, that they have the space. So why don't they just do that, Kim? What are they saying? Yeah, absolutely. The argument that I've gotten from LG is that um, it, it's just going to delay the project. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board, you're going to have to redesign the building, and then you're going to have to go through the approval process again, which, you know, they say for, for their economic needs, for the best needs of their company, they are pretty adamant that they want to be in that building by 2017. And by delaying it, that's just going to, that's just going to ruin their timeline. Would that ruin their timeline, Michelle? Well, certainly they would have to go back and, and redo their design, uh, but I would imagine that uh, Englewood Cliffs is so keen to have them stay there, they would make every effort to fast track and facilitate, uh, you know, the redesign and the rebuild of a structure that, of a low design. Uh, you know, I can't imagine that it's going to delay it overly. Um, and in fact, uh, if they don't redesign, the litigation is continuing to delay. Um, as we speak right now, they are not free to go ahead and build the building because there's litigation pending. You mentioned the litigation. There's a court case against the variance that the city of Englewood Cliffs uh, issued to allow them to build over 35 feet. So what's the legal argument there? Is there any question that Englewood Cliffs has the right, even if you don't like it? Well, they, Englewood Cliffs granted a variance. Um, and that was appealed, and the court upheld the appeal, and now it's in the appellate division. So we're continuing to move forward on that. The, the lower court did not take the Palisades into account. Um, and, you know, it, there are, are numerous uh, issues that are being litigated right now uh, that are going to take time to work their way through the courts. And Kim and Trenton, I understand you're in Trenton because there may be uh, a state angle developing on this story. What's happening? Uh, well, there was a hearing in front of the New Jersey Senate Environmental and Energy Committee this morning um, to discuss proposed legislation that it is likely going to be passed or introduced this week. Um, this could be actually very significant. Um, the legislation that they're looking to introduce um, would bar any development over 35 feet in height if, um, north of Fort Lee along the Palisades. And what they're looking to do is make that retroactive. So any, basically any development that is approved already, but the foundation of which isn't completed by May 1st, which is Thursday, I believe, it would apply to that. So obviously this would you pose a huge problem for LG. Because so the state might too. come in and trump what the city of Englewood Cliffs did on its own and say, no, no, this is a state resource. It's town after town, city after city. It's our Palisades. And so we as the state are going to overrule you on this. Think that's going to pass the legislature? Can you read those tea leaves yet? You know, I've been putting out calls. It's hard to say. Uh, I know that there have been a lot of concerns. I at least spoke to uh, Senator Loretta Weinberg, who represents Englewood Cliffs. And she, you know, she won't say what her position is, but she does very much question the legality of this retroactive clause. And so, one other thing, I gather that there's a 
uh, public hearing in Englewood Cliffs at the city level. I think it's in city council chambers on Wednesday night. Michelle, is this meant to be a big moment? Well, my understanding is, is that Englewood Cliffs is revising its master plan, uh, which would more or less um, retroactively after the fact go in and revise the plan to allow these types of high rises to be built in Englewood Cliffs. So I'm sure that this is a, it's an opportunity for people who live in Englewood Cliffs and in the area to weigh in because this is a major change to the master plan. So I understand this is a big moment for the opposition and they're hoping for a big turnout um, at that uh, Wednesday evening meeting tonight as many of you are seeing this in um, Englewood Cliffs at the City Council Chambers. So, Kim, if it passes the legislature, any clue yet whether Governor Christie would sign it? Will he say, time for a traffic jam in Englewood Cliffs? You know, I, I posed the question to them. I haven't gotten a response back, so who knows? All right. I, I know in the past he has said that he didn't want to get involved and that it, he considered it only a local issue. Well, if the state legislature says it's a state issue, then it may force his hand if it lands on his desk. So we will see. Thank you both very much for joining us. And viewers, if you're interested in this issue, we will have an update on that Wednesday night uh, public hearing on tomorrow's Brian Lehrer Show on the radio on WNYC Radio, 10 a.m. Thursday morning. Up next right here, hemp. Is it a wonder plant for the environment and the economy? Hemp, not to be confused with its closely related cousin, marijuana, is about to get its day in the sun. According to our next guest, this wonder plant will improve our diets, rejuvenate our soil, fill government tax coffers, and even wean the country off petroleum. What has he been smoking? Comedian and best-selling author Doug Fine joins us from the state of Washington to talk about his latest book, Hemp, uh, hemp Bound, it's called Hemp Bound, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Next Agricultural Revolution. Welcome. Hello from New York. Oh, hey, thanks for having me. And I should say that that sounding like your roommate with the lava lamp about hemp is the result of two years of field research. So I, I come back and, and uh, kind of bring this message um, confidently. I'm glad it's all very scientific. And tell us the difference between help, hemp and pot. Well, um, the cannabis plant with less than 0.1% of THC, the psychoactive component, is considered hemp. Uh, it's cultivated all over the world in Canada's 15-year-old modern industry, its billion-dollar industry. Um, there's been zero cases of confusion, and the reason for that is industrial hemp will spoil a psychoactive cannabis plant immediately once the pollen creates seeds in the flowers on the sort of the money crop of psychoactive cannabis. So same plant, different way to use it. Is something changing under the law that we're going to have this conversation now about hemp as an agricultural product? Yes, indeed. So um, after 77 years of hemp prohibition, this past February in the federal farm bill, there was a provision that allows hemp cultivation for university research in the now 14 states and growing that have their own hemp legislation. And we're moving uh, very rapidly to full commercial cultivation of hemp again which is a good thing because farmers today in Canada are profiting from the seed oil at $300 per acre. That's 10 times what they're making from GMO corn and soy. So let's take a look, folks, at some of the purported benefits of hemp. Up in Canada, Doug made a video about hemp making for a better breakfast. Let's watch. All right, so what we've got here are some of the eggs from the chicken feeding trial at the University of Manitoba. We're going to look at these to see a little bit of comparison. So we've got a um, um, C20, which is a control, no hemp. We have a 12%, and then we have a um, 20% hemp in there. So we're going to have a peek to see what these egg yolks look like. And that's 20% of the hen's feed that's was yes. hemp. Yeah, so 20% of the ration or 0% of the ration included hemp. Right. So we're starting with the 20, which is no hemp. So you can have a look at how, what that egg yolk color looks like. And now we're going to compare this to the egg yolk of... Wow. You can see the difference in the color in the egg yolk there. Really beautiful color on the hemp-fed Happy Hen chicken's product. Hemp-fed, not hemp-fed. Hemp-fed, not hemp-fed. 
Still going to eat them all, though. So, um, yellower yolks, this is an indicator of quality? Um, no, actually, this is a University of Manitoba study where we, I, I got to do the visual, but actually the data is the hemp-fed group of hens is passing on not only a higher omega fatty acid profile, but higher in a number of important mineral categories. So um, the really sort of impressive superfood qualities of hemp when fed to livestock um, passes on into the food that we then eat. Right, and that livestock is not eating the equivalent of marijuana lace brownies. They don't get high from the hemp. You made that clear before, right? Yes, right. And hemp oil, I, you know, I have two small children. You can put uh, hemp oil in the morning shake we do every day. It's a, it's a fantastic. It's in the same category as um, uh, fish oil, flax oil. It's just a little bit better than both of those in different ways. And more video. I can build a house with hemp. Watch this. This is the woody portion on the inside, and that's used to create things um, such as this piece of fiberboard. So you can see that the, it's got the herd in there. It's also used to create um, like a hempcrete wall. So here we've got hemp mixed with lime binders. So all in, all in the same um, mode, using the same core ingredient. And then also you've got something like this product. This is um, a mushroom mycelia mixed with hemp herd to make a 100% compostable packaging material for a replacement for like um, 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 styrofoam wrap. or bubble wrap type of scenario. On the industrial type of side, you get um, something like this um, batting. So this would be a direct replacement for pink insulation in your home. So you could directly replace this. Um, no toxic chemicals made um, to manufacture. This is a non-woven matting and needle punch. Um, another thing that the bass fibers can go into is um, something like paper making. So this is a great little company. Um, that makes hemp paper, handmade hemp paper, and she uses the bass fiber to do that. So we had a few uh, new vocabulary words in that video. At the end, she talked about bass fiber, and earlier, with respect to building a building, hempcrete. I guess we can figure out what hempcrete is. Uh, how about bass fiber? What is that? I'd like to tell you, talk to you about both because hempcrete, hempcrete is amazing. Marks and Spencer just built a flagship department store out of this stuff in uh, Britain. It's uh, an amazing building material, both for load bearing and for um, for insulation. That has a higher R value. This again, a study that I visited in person. Uh, higher R value than pink insulation and much friendlier to the environment to build as well as more energy efficient after building. We're, I think it's going to be the first killer app on the fiber side that we're going to see here in the new world. And then as far as bass fiber, hemp has, again, you know, your roommate with a lava lamp said it, and I'm sorry, he or she was right. You know, as a journalist, I have to always say, like, I'm a little bit astonished how much the legend about hemp actually proved true in the field. And it's probably because we've been utilizing the plant for nine or 10,000 years. But these bass fibers really are, when harvested correctly, stronger than steel. And that's why today Mercedes and BMW uses it in door panels. Um, it's just a better material, lighter, more fuel efficient, easily replicable. Um, and from an earth perspective as a sustainability journalist. So let, let's, let's watch some video about that. The real killer app for hemp could be its ability to reduce oil consumption in our cars and fancy limousines, as you will see here. <laughs> Filling up a 1979 Mercedes limo, first owned by Ferdinand Marcos, with hemp no shoes oil in the trunk. fuel. No shoes in the trunk. None of them held the shoes in the trunk, says Bill Althaus, who acquired this Canadian hemp oil someday domestic hemp oil we hope and we're going to be driving around in this limo today powered not by petroleum but by the cannabis plant that was so retro doug i don't think i've heard an emilda marco shoe joke in 25 years <laughs> yeah i always like to keep the humor timely that's right uh, yeah we actually it was a great uh, 100 or so mile trip we took and bill who's an engineer um, was trying to prove the point that really and truly, you know, in practice, we can stop using petroleum today through hemp. Now, here in the States, we don't have real big diesel, um, you know, saturation of our market other than the commercial uh, trucking fleet. So I think the first hemp energy ap application is going to be through using the otherwise unusable stalks that are done where after you harvest the seed harvest and the fiber harvest um, in a biomass 
anaerobic combustion process known as gasification. The army is interested in this. They've been buying up gasification units and parts of Europe are becoming energy independent on it. I think if we really replace those amber waves of GMO grain across the heartland with massive hemp fields, we might have a real viable solution of, to our energy issue through gasification. And what does that car smell like as it drives by you on the sidewalk? It's not like some rich guy smoking a joint coming out of the exhaust pipe, is it? No, I mean, I can tell you with some experience on this because I do drive on vegetable oil on my own website. There's videos of that. And you do get the munch. It smells like, uh, you know, uh, a fryer. You know, you, you want to turn off at the nearest uh, Chinese restaurant and start ordering fried dumplings or Kung Pao chicken or something. But no, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> driving on the hemp oil doesn't smell like cannabis, nor does, nor does combusting um, through gasification, which a Kentucky utility is already starting to buy up land to plant on marginal uh, coal damage and tobacco monoculture damaged soil there. So this is, this is the real deal. This is not uh, a pipe dream, so to speak. So what are the next steps in clearing a path for hemp production? Because you're here advocating something that isn't a done deal yet, right? It's almost a done deal. I mean, there's clear bipartisan support. The, uh, the Farm Bill provision passed with very little opposition. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican uh, Senate leader, is fully behind it, as is, uh, you know, more obvious players. Ron Wyden um, in Oregon is putting forth a new bill this year called S-359 that would allow full commercial cultivation rather than what has been approved this year, which is university research to rebuild our seed stock and cultivars, which unfortunately were lost during the 77 years of prohibition. There's a portion in the book where um, a researcher goes and sort of Indiana Jones style back of a warehouse um, in the uh, National Seed Repository in Virginia and finds the last two bags of our once pride of the world uh, Kentucky hemp seed stock and it, they were rotted. So we're starting from scratch and rebuilding our, uh, our genetics. And there are some states I understand that are leading the way including Colorado which everybody think oh yeah Colorado that's the state that just legalized recreational pot but I want to say before you give us your last answer which is this um, that even though we've been joking around a little bit, one of the main points here, just to reinforce it, is that though this comes from the same cannabis plant, this is not about pot, this is about another product of that plant, which is hemp, totally different and for all these different industrial uses that we've been discussing. But why is Colorado leading the way or how? It's very much about bottom line figures. The Canadians cannot keep up with demand. The demand for hemp seed oil, the nutritive seed oil part of it, is growing 20% per year. They're approaching a billion dollar industry in Canada. I interviewed in the book the number one uh, sort of seed oil processing mogul up there and he can't wait for us Americans to start putting our small farmers back to work growing hemp because they can't keep up with demand um, uh, in Canada. So that's what's behind Colorado is ahead of federal law now. Um, in issuing commercial cultivation, hemp cultivation permits to their farmers this year, um, and not just research permits. Hopefully federal law will catch up very soon. Or we could build a Keystone hemp oil pipeline and bring it down from Canada. Never mind, that's another show. <laughs> well, it's somewhat relevant, actually, because in truth, Today, uh, uh, this hemp seed oil, I uh, bless you Canadians for providing it, but it's very expensive and it would be fantastic to have American processors making this so that I can put that in my shake every morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Examples of spite. Getting off a subway car slowly so a rude person cannot easily enter. Leaving rotting food in the fridge to annoy a roommate who leaves her fingernail clippings on the kitchen table. Aha, you've been there. Or a classic, turning music up after someone said to turn it down. But why? What's the point? Scientists are only beginning to crack this phenomenon we call spite. One study, published in the journal Psychological Assessment, created a spite scale. Another, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, links spite to human evolution in our quest for fairness of all things. Joining us, authors of both those research papers, Washington State University Director of Clinical Training, David Marcus, and Patrick Forber, Professor of the Philosophy of Biology at Tufts University. Thank you both very much for coming on. Welcome. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Professor Marcus, uh, define spite as you measured it. What exactly are you measuring here when you measure spite? We're aiming to measure uh, spitefulness as a personality trait that involves a willingness to suffer some kind of harm or uh, loss to oneself in order to hurt someone else. Uh -huh. So it's more, more specific than just aggressive behavior. Right. So it is literally 
related to the phrase, cutting off your nose to spite your face, because you have to suffer some harm in the process in order to get the satisfaction that comes from harming another. Do I get that right? Exactly, yes. And Professor Forber, are you using the same definition? Uh, it's analogous, but um, so I've worked with formal models in game theory, and so we are tuned to the costs and benefits of the behavior. So spite in this context is a uh, behavior that costs you something but inflicts a harm. Game theory basically being the study of decision making, right? Right, exactly. So how we make decisions about how much, in, in, uh, how much harm to inflict upon ourselves in order to inflict harm upon others when we're motivated by spite. So Professor Marcus, I see that you developed a 17 point spite scale. We pulled a few examples from it to show our viewers. Here is number one of 17. So as we look at this on the screen, this would be spiteful, but the least spiteful on this scale. Example, it might be worth risking my reputation in order to spread gossip about someone I did not like. Okay, so I guess you conceive of that as a little bit spiteful. Let's go on to the next one so that we can see a comparison here. Number two, if I am going to my car in a crowded parking lot and it appears that another driver wants my parking space, then I will make sure to take my time pulling out of the parking space. So can you contrast those two and tell us why one is more spiteful than the other? Actually, I'm not sure that one is more spiteful than, than the other. The order of the items really didn't have to do with how spiteful they oh, were so me. much as just the order that they were on the scale. I see. Uh, so what are you getting at with those two examples, nevertheless? Uh, well, it, it, again, in each case, what we're really trying to get at uh, in the first one, it's pretty overt. Uh, you're risking your reputation, so you really are willing to take a hit in order to hurt someone else's reputation. That's pretty and serious. Then, your reputation is a big, big deal. And, and the second one, actually, if anything, probably is the more subtle one because, I mean, you're just giving up maybe a few seconds of your life to pull out a little bit more slowly. Uh, so there's still, you're annoyed at this other person, you're trying to harm them a little bit, but it, it's, it's hardly, a, it's a very minor inconvenience. Right. And Professor and, and Marcus, to stay with you for a minute, my understanding is that you were primarily interested in measuring who is spiteful. Do I have that right? Yes, we were trying to look at a way to measure individual differences in spitefulness, that assuming some people tend to be more spiteful than others, this was, this was sort of a first crack at uh, how could we measure that. And what were the results? Uh, the results were that scores on the scale did vary, and they did go along with other personality traits that you would expect kind of spiteful people to be higher in. So people who are more aggressive are also more spiteful. People who are more narcissistic, especially in a way in which they feel entitled uh, and to exploit others, are also more spiteful. People with some callous and unemotional, unempathic personality traits also tend to be, all those traits tend to hang together with spitefulness, while folks who are high in agreeableness, that tends to go the opposite way, high agreeableness, low spitefulness. So, Professor Forber, you studied spite in evolution, correct? Right. Tell us about what you studied. So um, with my colleague Rory Smead, we've explored these formal models that examine the origination and stability of social behavior. And so spite is behavior that costs the actor but inflicts a harm in contrast to altruism, which I pay a cost to render aid. Right? And what we found is that under some conditions, spite can be favorable and as a byproduct produces some fair behavior in the population produces some fair behavior in the population. Explain that, because you're talking about people who are unempathic, people who are aggressive, people who are not prone to altruism. Uh, so how does right. that kind of behavior produce more fairness in evolutionary so, terms? Good question. So what happens is that the spiteful types tend to go after non-spiteful types, in particular selfish individuals. So individuals that tr just look out for themselves but don't inflict any harm, they suffer the most when spiteful types are introduced into the population. And as a result, the strategy that gets along best with these spiteful types when they're around are fair, tolerant individuals. Individuals that will play fairly in some interactions and tolerate spite in other interactions. They're uh, deploying fairness as a kind of defense mechanism against spite in certain uh, 
cases. In your opinion, Professor Lorber, can, uh, Forber, can spite ever be a good thing? You know, um, that depends. Spite by itself hurts. I do worse, you do worse. And that's generally not a good thing. Um, but however spite can be exported into other strategic contexts, it can become a kind of punishment, right? And punishment itself can help stabilize cooperation and fair behavior. So you might think that, so it's hockey playoff time right now, so a lot of people are watching the hockey playoffs and fighting is a big and controversial element in hockey. So fighting is a kind of spite, right? The team pays a cost by taking a penalty to inflict a cost on another on another player of another team, right? Um, in some cases, if that other team is playing dirty and sending the enforcer out to start the fight can encourage them to play fair, spite can be useful. But generally, it's, it's harmful behavior, and it's going to decrease both our um, well-being. Professor Marcus, same question. Yeah, and I completely agree there. I, I think m much of the time spitefulness can be destructive and problematic, uh, but it also can serve to enforce social norms. It can, it can in, in a sense, again, in one way, I guess spite uh, is obviously closely related to altruism because you are willing to suffer a cost uh, that may actually have long-term positive consequences uh, for the group. Would you say that spite arises, Professor Marcus, from a sense of injustice? Would that be a common cause or the most common cause? Very, very much. I think people behave most spitefully when they feel like they've been treated unfairly or when an injustice has taken place. Uh, you know, I've run into some people, especially since the papers come out, who describe themselves as just sort of being consistently spiteful all of the time. Uh, I don't know if, if they're being entirely serious there, but for the most part, most of us can be, certainly can be spiteful when we feel like rules have been broken, something has happened that's unfair, especially if it has an impact directly on us. So, Professor Forber, where's the line between justice and revenge? Look, that's an excellent <laughs> question. <laughs> and, you know, philosophers have been wondering about this for a long time, right? If you can tie this sort of costly, harmful behavior to enforcing uh, norms of fairness, then it looks like just punishment. But sometimes this can be misconstrued or misapplied, right? We might have this motivation to punish people, and it might be there for good reasons. It just gets deployed in certain social contexts in bad ways. When you look at Congress today, for example, do you <laughs> see spitefulness? I think political smear campaigns might count as an excellent instance of spite, right? The person engaging in the smear campaign is paying a cost, maybe losing some voters, but inflicting perhaps a larger cost on their opponent by decreasing their voter base um, even more. So that can generate a net advantage for the person starting the smear campaign. But then that's pure calculation. Is that spite? I mean, if the smear campaign is going to benefit your side politically and ultimately hurt that person politically or their party, is that spite or is that just calculation? Um, that's a good question. So I guess it depends on the outcome of the election, right? So in the primaries, it might, by hurting your voter base, you might not win at all. So it might be spite to engage in a smear campaign. But if you win the election, then I think you're right. It's calculation, self-serving calculation. Professor uh, Forward, do spiteful personality types tend to be successful, unsuccessful? Is there any correlation? You know, psychology is really Dr. Marcus's area of expertise. I am mostly focused on the formal models, so I'm not sure. All right. So, Dr. Marcus, I'll go to you with that question. Is there any data? Uh, not yet that I'm aware of. I think that part of developing the scale is a first attempt to be able to measure individual differences in spitefulness. And then we can look at uh, does it relate to uh, greater success in life does it, or, or more problems. Uh, you know, certainly, again, anecdotally, it looks like folks who are more spiteful do end up in more contentious divorces, maybe more litigation over the course of their life. So it, you'd think that there's a lot, uh, there's a big downside to being spiteful, especially cross-situationally, but that's still something I think we've got to collect some data on to, to And know so since, since you teach clinical psychology, mm -hmm. are the findings from your studies something that you can use in private practice with patients? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I, I mean, there's a couple of ways that spitefulness shows up in the clinical literature. Uh, there's a disorder called oppositional de defiant disorder and that's usually diagnosed in kids. These are kids who don't follow rules, who fight back, who, who are argumentative, and 
you know, the real handful for parents to deal with. Uh, and spiteful or vindictive behaviors, one of the diagnostic criteria of uh, this oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, a borderline personality disorder is another one uh, that likely, although it's not a formal criterion uh, of uh, borderline personality disorder, it does seem like individuals with that personality disorder tend to behave spitefully, even uh, cutting themselves or hurting themselves, often as a way to lash out at someone who they feel has abandoned or wronged them, uh, so, which would be a pretty extreme example of spitefulness. So, Professor Forber, this is like schadenfreude, right? We get pleasure watching other people suffer. They're, they could be connected. I mean, it's not surprising. So I think one interesting outcome of our study is that um, the urge to punish can come apart from the role punishment serves in maintaining fair behavior. And that means maybe Nietzsche was right about punishment. It originated through some motivation for revenge and or schadenfreude, and then only later was co-opted as a mechanism for maintaining justice or fairness. What do you study next, Professor Forber? What's the follow-up? So the idea now is to look at how um, the conditions that might favor spite would co-evolve with the behavioral strategies in a population. So it's looking at more complex models so that we can um, develop a richer perspective on how evolution might have unfolded in highly social species like ourselves. And for you, Professor Marcus? Our next step is to really see if this measure that we have, which hangs with other personality traits we, ex we expect it to hang with, can it actually now predict behavior, maybe above and beyond some of these more general types. So do people uh, in an ultimatum game where, uh, be play more spitefully if they're higher in trait spitefulness, beyond how they would if they were just more aggressive or more narcissistic, for example? Well, in spite of the topic, I hope you can learn something. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. High tech, is it truly the core of New York's economic future, the way manufacturing once was and finance is today? According to a recent report, tech has already created more than half a million jobs in New York City and generated $50 billion in annual salaries. Impressive numbers, to say the least. But does the de Blasio administration appreciate the importance of the growing tech sector? Or does this report, co-sponsored by New York Tech Meetup, Google, City, the bank, and the Association for a Better New York paint too rosy a picture of high tech. Joining us, Andrew Roche, chairman of the New York Tech Meetup, and Greg David, columnist at Crane's New York Business, blogger and director of the Business and Economics Reporting Program here at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Brian. You were involved with this report. Tell us about it. Well, our goal was to have, start a conversation with the new administration and policymakers throughout New York about a transformation that's happening in New York in its relationship to the global hyperconnected economy where technology, science, and math are building new businesses, creating new opportunities for economic growth and innovation. And the goal of the report was to identify for these policymakers that New York's relationship with the tech community is not just about a bunch of little startups in what's known as Silicon Alley, as, as it's sometimes called as a counterpart to Silicon Valley, but rather a transformation of New York's traditional industries of finance, insurance, real estate, and media, or sometimes referred to as FIRE, uh, into tech businesses themselves. So Citigroup, for example, thinks of itself, or Citi thinks of itself as a tech company, as does uh, the New York Times. And companies like Metropolitan Insurance uh, and others are now chasing after the same high-quality engineering talent for their own businesses that startups themselves were looking for. Is that why the report refers not so much to the tech sector as the tech ecosystem? Exactly. So what's different about New York than what is happening in Silicon Valley is that Silicon Valley, which is an innovation capital, <coughs> built primarily around the notion that the internet infrastructure was laid by the marriage of, the, of hardware and software, the, the invention of the silicon chip, and the birth of the internet that created companies like Google and Yahoo and, and, the, uh, and the computer companies that you know, service that growth, HP, um, Intel, and others. But in New York, what's happening is, is that the, the, the cost of, of uh, not just in New York, but the, because of the cost of uh, software uh, production has dropped, because we have broadband and mobile networks, social media, and other tools, it's the human capital applied to technology that gives the application, that gives, it's creating the application layer that's giving New York an advantage. So, Greg, you've written that the tech sector 
uh, boom in New York has been somewhat exaggerated. Is that your position? Yes, and this was the latest in a long line of ridiculous reports, and this one was the worst, far and away the worst. But I need to thank Andrew, because it's a tremendous teaching tool. I've already given it to my Baruch students to teach them how not to be taken to the cleaners, and it will be the first exercise in the fall when my J school students return. Ouch. Here's what's fundamentally wrong with it, as he just said. The question when you look at a tech sector and what is a tech job, you need to ask yourself, is it a cost or a revenue generator? Here at CUNY, we have an enormous number of tech people. Tech is crucial and a vital force in every university in the country. But they are a cost. We need to pay them. We need to find a revenue generating model to pay them. That's the case. City is not a tech company. Therefore, they are a cost. Secondly, there's no difference in New York to Detroit or Texas or Austin or other places for these people who are costs. The truth is that we all have the same number of tech people in virtually all the same percentages because we need them to do our job. The question you asked in your intro, can tech replace finance, which is the most important question, Tech can replace finance not because CUNY's hiring tech people, but because we have tech people here who generate revenues, who create the virtuous economic cycle that is so clear in Silicon Valley. Tech makes Silicon Valley rich the way Wall Street makes New York rich. Companies that are really tech companies. Google, Apple, companies like that. And the startups Not we just have the here. fact that you need a lot of tech employees in all kinds of other industries. That's the distinction you're making? Yes, that is the distinction I'm making. And that's what makes tech a vital sector in the economy. And that's what will make the New York economy better. Now, I do want to make a point clear immediately. What I've actually written is that being number two is not so bad. Are we, we number two? We are clear, in my view, in the country? we are clearly number two in the country. We are a long way away from Silicon Valley, or actually what the report did really poorly is you have to put San Francisco and Silicon Valley together. We are light years away from them, but we are also now ahead of every other place. So being number two isn't bad, it just ain't what that report showed. Well, Talk to each other. Well, the, we've never claimed in the report that we were number one. What we were trying to it do. It does claim you're number one. It has all these numbers. It shows New York like here and Silicon Valley like no, here. No, the on. most distorted graphs that people had seen in a long time. The goal of the report was to show that New York's growth in terms of other sectors was growing at a faster rate. So in that sense, we were number one. But our select but you're being selective about the, the, the data in saying that we were claiming that we're number one. Obviously, Silicon Valley continues to be an amazing center for innovation and growth and for um, value creation, as you just described it. The goal of the report was not to try to make ourselves into a counterpart to Silicon Valley, but to make people in New York understand that for New York to be a successful city in the 21st century, all of its public policies need to be aligned, whether it's talent creation, workforce development, science and math education in public schools, broadband, or other infrastructure, if for New York to continue to be number two, as you say, then we have to start looking at those. And frankly, for someone who used to say that the tech industry was a bubble in New York and it would never match up to Silicon Valley, to hear you say that we're a strong number two is actually a vindication. I said a, I said a clear number two. Well, okay. And we don't know whether it's a bubble but, or but, not yet. But, Greg, in years past, you have said that you thought that the New York tech thing was a bubble, I and then after Tumblr was bought by Yahoo, you basically told me that you were wrong. And so, it, you know, there's a, there's a segment of, of our city that sort of wants to look at the world through the lens of the 20th century, and our report is trying to get people to look through the lens of the 21st. So, um, th uh, this, this would mean, if we're number two, that we have passed Boston, which is oh, the city we clearly, we clearly have passed that I always Boston. hear compared, oh, Boston is so far ahead of us in this. Not anymore. No, they only want, the reason people still think Boston is number two is that by the measures that we should use against this industry, IPOs, venture capital, and mergers and acquisition volume, Boston still comes out number two a lot. That's because um, they aren't much better than we are in biotech, and biotech gets a lot more venture capital money. But in other ways, I, 
in other ways, we are, a we are a solid number two because in all other measures, we are better than Boston. These sites, these cities that were supposed to be rising, like Austin and Colorado and all that, have been left behind mm. for the reasons that New York is a center of tech. Our mm -hmm. historic strengths in um, advertising-related um, tech businesses, our historic the way we've developed some new businesses, even in social media, which I was a skeptic about, and we're doing somewhat better on. So by those measures, we are important. But you know, let's, so you, so you use the phrase 500,000 jobs, right, to our uh -huh. beginning. Well, we've got a report from the controller that came out today, and it puts the number of tech jobs done appropriately at a little north than 100,000. Well, it matters when they issue a report that puts out a 500,000. So, Andrew, number. are these And different? this report clearly says, using mostly my criteria for uh -huh. tech, that we've got 100,000 jobs. Apples and oranges? I haven't read the, this uh, report came out from the state controller, and I'd like to look at those numbers before I comment on it. And I think that there's the, the, the goal here is there should be lots of reports. We should be analyzing this entire sector as much right. as possible. All right. So let me back away from the dispute between the two of you over where we are, number one, number two, and, and you know, if the report misleads us and stuff like that. You say that you are issuing this report largely to start a conversation among policymakers. Is that because you're not confident that the de Blasio administration, brand new as it is, gets it? in a way that the Bloomberg administration did? So the Bloomberg administration did a fantastic job uh, supporting tech, cheerleading tech. Uh, the Cornell Technion Center was clearly a very important step to point to a future that New York should be aspiring to achieve. And so I like to say that the Bloomberg administration set the stage, and now it's up to the new mayor, de Blasio, to deliver on the first act. And the first act is to understand the, 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 the imperative that we need broadband, we need our kids wired, we need to be teaching science and math in our public schools and in our universities, and we need to be developing the talent to feed the economy of the 21st century in New York. So it's not, the, the de Blasio administration is just getting started. Um, they acknowledge the report. They have acknowledged that their $500 million in workforce development should be probably rethought, that teaching kids how to fix typewriters in the Bronx is probably not a good use of that money. But how you go from teaching people in the industrial age to learning knowledge-based skills to be able to get jobs or start companies in the 21st century is not an easy thing to do. do you, so that's why I'm saying it's a conversation starter. Greg, do you have an early assessment of the different approach that the de Blasio administration is taking toward tech sector job growth from the Bloomberg administration? Is there a difference? Um, uh, you know what, the issue is that worries me is that they will take the wrong ideas from the report. Not that those things aren't important, and I do think broadband is really important because the question is is whether we're going to uh, have broadband so tech can spread out from the Midtown South area it is so strong in. But generating this virtuous economic cycle is going to require the fact that the de Blasio administration will give tech the emotional support that the Bloomberg administration did, which God knows the mayor virtually every week talked about how important it was in a hyperbole way, which drove me nuts as well. And I don't see that part coming out of the administration. It would worry me if the de Blasio administration actually followed all the recommendations of the report and emphasized what's happening in the high schools and CUNY. What we need to make sure is that the brilliant entrepreneurs here, the John Orangers who created our single most successful company called Shutterstock, still come to New York, still start their companies here, take them public, and create the But what recommendations cycle. in the report would you not follow? more broadband, more workforce development, more understand, more, a, a more transparent and a more connected government because the, you know, what many people don't realize is that de Blasio and the New York City government is still uh, basically a 1980 Pontiac. I mean, what, walk into a police station today and tell me what year it is. I mean, it still feels like we're stuck in the 1980s. So, so what recommendations specifically in our report, forget the, the data or the charts that may have been badly uh, shown, what recommendations would you not follow? Well, as I've said in other venues and in other issues, I want the mayor to become an advocate for the economy and the people who make it work. And that wasn't in your report especially, and that's not what he's doing, and that's what worries So let me take an example of something that they are doing, at least saying. Because I have a quote here from Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn, 
who says that tech jobs should be filled by regular New Yorkers. And I take that to mean not just an emphasis on like the Cornell uh, tech campus where you know the, the, the Ivy League level uh, graduate students would come but focusing down the socioeconomic scale for tech jobs. Is that a particularly de Blasio tale of two cities kind of thing? Yes, and of course it is. And do you approve or disapprove? Well there's nothing wrong with it. The question is it's not adequate enough for a broad-based policy. It's like yes that's classic. You know all right here's my great example it has to do with the release of the report. So Alicia Glenn is there, and she re releases the report. The mayor shows up at the end, to at suddenly, unexpectedly, and instead of saying a word about the tech community, he talks about his pre-K victory, which came the day before. It would have been great for him to come to that event and talk at that point about how important the tech community is. Now, I hear he's going to do it for I Internet Week is coming up, and he's going to do it then. I hope he does, but that has been lacking in this administration. And I read something, Andrew, maybe you can fill in the blanks here, about people who don't have college degrees also working in the tech sector, which is not how we generally think of the tech sector. Right. So what, what, one thing our report um, uncovered, and you're happy to check the statistics, Greg, is that almost half the jobs in the tech sector uh, do not require college degrees. Um, so what kinds of jobs are we talking? You're so, not just talking so, about so, the so, receptionist. So, uh, no, a home, you know, someone who's doing human resources, or someone who's doing accounting, or somebody who's doing just uh, the kind of jobs service. I don't think we should count. Well, but for they, the record, but, but they are important jobs in that these companies are developing businesses, and they have all similar needs, very similar needs to other traditional uh, 20th century businesses in having customer relation people, human resource needs, health insurance needs, and so forth. And the people who are doing that kind of work don't necessarily have to have college. Aha. Uh -huh. That's why your report has 500,000 tech sector jobs and the controller's report has 100,000. Is that yeah, and he's including example. every ad salesperson right. in New York. And he's including, by the way, the people who work on the copper wires at Verizon. I mean, there's a whole list of ways our, our in which goal, people our, who should not Our goal have was, to, was to broaden the way we think about a tech job. And there are people who are doing specifically working in tech companies, but there are people who are working at the New York Times and at Citigroup that for the, if it wasn't for tech, they would not have that job. Well, I think we all want the same thing here more employment no matter how you ca categorize tech jobs and the other jobs that the tech sector produces um, on its fringes or whatever and there's a little more context about where we are in the tech ecosystem in New York City. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our program for this week. You will find a new show here each week at this hour and do tune into my radio program weekdays 10 a.m. to noon on WNYC 93.9 FM and AMA 20. Tomorrow an update on the Palisades LG headquarters story as we are expecting developments tonight. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.